my salutations to all of you welcome back to the ninth session of the gita odyssey live series in the last few sessions we have been reviewing the bhagavad gita dhyan and today we will review shlokas 7 8 and 9 and with that we will conclude our discussion on gita dhyanam so bhagavad gita dhyanam as we have seen is a set of nine shlokas usually recited before the study of the bhagavad gita particularly in the advaita vedanta tradition with the purpose of connecting the seeker to the message of the bhagavad gita when you chant this gita dhyanam connects us with the purpose of the bhagavad gita it connects us with the teacher of the bhagavad gita it connects us with the subject matter of the bhagavad gita and it reveals the beautiful points such as the connection between bhagavad gita and the upanishads it talks about the divine grace and essentially it tunes our mind with the bhagavad gita and that is one of the major purpose of this gita dhyanam apart from that the gita dhyanam by itself is a beautiful composition we can use this as a prayer and even we can use this as an object of meditation because we can use this for beautiful visualization meditation that is the purpose of this gita dhyanam without any further delay let's try to see shlokas 7 8 and 9 पाराशर्यवचसुजमल गीताकेसर हरिकथा संबोधना बोधि लोके सज्जन षटपदर पेपीयमान मुदा भूयाद्भारत पंगज कलिमल प्रध्वंसीन श्रेयसी श्लोक सेवन इज ए ब्यूटिफुल श्लोक टॉकिंग अबाउट द ग्लोरी ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट एपिक महाभारत सो द श्लोक इज एसेंशियली a salutations to mahabharata we have seen that each one of these gita shlokas offer salutations or reveal a beautiful aspect of different things connected with gita the about the mother gita about the author of the gita about the compiler of the gita so this shloka talks about mahabharata the great epic of ancient india so this shloka visualizes mahabharata like a lotus parasharya vachas saroja mamalam geetartha gandotkadam nanakhyanaka kesaram harikada sambodana boditam so this bhuyat bharata pankajam so the mahabharatam is compared to a lotus the word used here to indicate lotus is pankajam so the mahabharata is compared to a lotus born out of the words of bhagwan vedavyasa maharshi vedavyasa so this lotus is born out of the words of vedavyasa and what is the speciality of this lotus amalam it is completely pure this lotus is completely pure even though it stands at the age of kali yuga but just like the lotus standing on a mud stays pure and the impurity of the mud is not affected to the to the lotus just like that even though the mahabharatam is standing or current time is kali yuga in that kali yuga the lotus of mahabharata stays pure and this mahabharata is born out of the words the words of sage vyasa and what is the speciality of this lotus the fragrance of this lotus is nothing but the bhagavad gita and the all the petals of the lotus this lotus has thousands of petals and what exactly are these petals 
thousands of stories are the petals of this Mahabharata lotus. But what exactly is the speciality of these stories? It is Harikatha Sambodhana Bodhidham. These tales or these stories are about the Lord Hari. They are about the Bhagawan. This is not a simple story. This story depicts the glory of the Bhagawan. The story depicts the glory of the Dharma. So summarizing, there is a lotus born out of the words of Vyasa. It stands pure even though it, it exists in the period of Kali Yuga. Just like the lotus is, stays pure even though it stands in a dirt. Like that, even though the Mahabharata exists in Kali Yuga, it stands as pure, it stays as pure. And the fragrance of this Mahabharata is nothing but the Bhagavad Gita. And... The petals of this Mahabharata are thousands of stories of Lord, the, 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 the Bhagavan, Hari. And the shloka continues. Loke Shajjana Satpadai Raha Raha Pepiyamanam Muda. So this Mahabharata with Bhagavad Gita as its fragrance and the stories of Ishwara as its petals attracts thousands of good people noble people, people who are interested in some growth, they, they are attracted to this lotus just like the honeybees get attracted to a flower. Just like that, all the good people come to this lotus of Mahabharata and enjoy the honey of the Bhagavad Gita and the stories of Hari and what exactly it is going to help them. So it is going to help them to manage the problem of Kali. Kali is the age we are living in. In this age, the dharma is always compromised. People cut corners. People become selfish. Everywhere you see that the adharma, meaning people don't follow what needs to be done. When that violation of dharma happens, how to navigate in that world where the dharma is always compromised? Righteousness prevails. How do you navigate your life? And Mahabharata shows that path. To, Mah the, to that Mahabharata, I offer my salutation. That is the essential meaning of this shloka. So, in other words, the Mahabharata is the hope of the people in the age of Kali. So, as per our Sanadana Dharma, the, 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 the time is divided into different, different Yuga. Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. The four Yugas are there. Each Yuga has its own characteristics. Where in Treta Yuga or Dwaraka Yuga, the Dharma was pretty much, people always follow Dharma. Selfishness was less. But in Kali, it is characterized by selfishness. People always cut corners and people are always living with the self-centered thought. And this is the difficulty of the age Kali. So in that age of Kali, it is very difficult to live a dharmic life because you are always tempted or you are always compelled. So the Mahabharata, one of the greatest epic of this universe because 87,500 shlokas, nothing in the world can be even compared to this epic in terms of size, in terms of content and in terms of narration. There is nothing in the world literature which can even come closer to Mahabharata. If you take the other two epics in the world, Iliad and Odyssey, and if you combine them, and the size of the Mahabharata is four times more than that. And there are hundreds of thousands of characters in the Mahabharata. They express different psychological thoughts. And in different, different situations, how they behave. Mahabharata beautifully paints that picture. And when you compromise that dharma, doing what needs to be done, what happens? That is beautifully explained. This has so many sub-stories. There are so many illustrations, so many Vedantic ideas, including the Bhagavad Gita, including the Vishnu Sahasranama. There are a lot of illustrations in Mahabharata. So, engaging with Mahabharata, it is going to help us to shape our character better, 
to understand the dharma better one of the best definitions of the dharma is given in mahabharata atmana pratikulani paresham na samajare don't do anything to others which i don't want from others so engaging with mahabharata getting connected with mahabharata is going to help me to understand dharma and navigate our life in this age of kali so the mahabharata the glory of this shloka essentially illustrates the glory of mahabharata and this mahabharata emerges from the vast reservoir of the words of the sage vyasa and the vyasa is introduced as the son of parashara the sage Par- parashara parashara and also this mahabharata is described as amalam because the mahabharata is portrayed as pure devoid of any impurities the beauty is that even though it stands and guiding us in the age of kali where impurity and selfishness and adharma are part and parcel of life this mahabharata stands pure like if like the filaments of the lotus or like the petals of the lotus the mahabharata the various um, uh, petals of the mahabharata are the various stories and the fragrance of the mahabharata which is contained in the bhagavad gita the fragrance of the mahabharata is bhagavad gita which is uh, contained in the mahabharata it is equated to the fragrance of that mahabharata it gives beauty to that lotus of mahabharata and the various narratives and various stories of the mahabharata is compared like the thousands of petals of that mahabharata there are hundreds of stories thousands of stories in mahabharata for example shakuntalam lot of lot of other people have taken each of these stories and expanded big for example karna shapadam it is part of the mahabharata shakuntalam it is part of the mahabharata the story of vaishali is part of mahabharata oh that mahabharata contains hundreds of thousands of story but what makes these stories special compared to the stories of the bollywood compared to the stories of the hollywood compared to the stories of the modern times what speaks makes the these stories of the mahabharata very special it is the presence of krishna the stories are about krishna and these stories make it really beautiful just like a sun helps a lotus to bloom presence of krishna makes the mahabharata lotus bloom that is very important to understand because of that presence of krishna the mahabharata story blooms and it shines forth and it emits its fragrance and attracts all sort of good people uh, towards the mahabharata and the the shloka 7 also beautifully tells that uh, lot of lot of good people lot of good people sajjana just attracted to mahabharata because of its fragrance of the gita because of the beautiful petals of krishna stories so lot of people get attracted to that and it helps us to navigate the challenges of the kali so a beautiful quote to reflect this is the 17th reflection of this course first step of the bhagavad gita please uh, contemplate upon these shlo- these uh, reflections because it can help you a lot as the lotus thrives amidst mure waters so does the mahabharata shine guiding souls through kali yuga's shadows that is very important to understand the nature of the kali is dirt or adharma but the lotus of the mahabharata helps people to meaning stay pure and inspires people to follow the life of dharma this is beautiful it's there is an interesting name for lotus flower it is pankajam panka means dirt jam means born out of so pankajam means that which born out of dirt even though the lotus is born out of dirt and it exists in dirt the essence of that lotus is pure purity so like that even though the mahabharata is guiding us in the age of kali but the impact of kali on that mahabharata is none rather than it guides us out of that problems of the age kali so let me pause here and request my co-author avanti kundalia to give her thoughts on this shloka namaskar 
so we look at mahabharata the beauty of the bhabharata or the lotus effect of the mahabharata only comes because of its underlying wisdom now two things you have to try and look at it that when we talk about there is that part in the shloka uh, rajeshi if you can put the shloka back up uh, the the translation of the shloka uh you know so when we look at the shloka itself when we look at the translation that, that there's one line which says like honey bees are drawn to a flower that way the wise are drawn to the mahabharata now if we go back to what we said in the beginning that do not get caught up in the context of the mahabharata story because if you don't have that eye of wisdom or you don't have the nose of the honey bee to sniff out that wisdom from this lotus of the mahabharata mahabharata without the wisdom or mahabharata without the bhagavad gita is a harry potter book not kidding because it is just pure entertainment so we have to understand if you look at the at some of arnab just asked a question which is the best translation of mahabharata to um, read well my mahabharata knowledge first and foremost came from the tv series which were it had a lot of fiction but it had a lot of uh, you know awe moments as well which really made you start thinking so when you look at it like that and why those tv series were so successful because there was always that narration voice over going on which tried to attract us to the main essence of what was happening so when you look through those tv series or you read the mahabharata the stories can be horrendous the politics the deceit the kind of games that are played over there so anybody who hears that mahabharata is a lotus they say how can that be some of the worst stories are over there some of the worst characters are over there but when you have that eye of wisdom you are able to just focus on the wisdom and see what the underlying message is now almost all commentator commentators of the mahabharata and bhagavad gita say that the mahabharata holds the highest essence in uh, sanatan dharma because nothing that has happened in any yuga doesn't find a story or root in the mahabharata it is outstanding right from test tube babies of how the you know the uh, what do you say um kauravas came about to everything i mean name it whatever you can think that can happen in human life you will find it in one story or another of the mahabharata so that is one of the greatest beauties of the mahabharata that look at your life right left center wherever whatever is happening if you go back through the pages of mahabharata you will find your story in there now when we uh, when we look at these stories each of these stories this is what we have to always focus on is that what is the underlying wisdom so arnab or anybody else who's actually going to be taking up the mahabharata you refer to the gita at all times because you will see that whatever problem stands out in the mahabharata there is a immediate antidote there is an immediate solution within the bhagavad gita to address that problem in the mahabharata so they have to go hand and hand in hand in hand you cannot separate the two and before you start reading the mahabharata if you start studying the gita a little bit then those stories would give you the right focus but if you have not studied the bhagavad gita at all and straight go i mean anybody who's come to bhagavad gita after watching the series and after going through mahabharata will be quite confused you know will always ask will always in fact many of them who i know tend to side on the uh, side of the kauravas or tend to side on uh, you know like what shakuni did oh it this happens in the world all the time but without this knowledge you will not be able to get the right import of mahabharata so for now instead of or uh, going through the pages of mahabharata quickly let's try and focus on at least the context and understand what the context of the gita is then to read the mahabharata it will be a little bit uh, easier thank you avanti it's a great compliment discussion now let's go to the next shloka shloka 8 mukam karoti vajalam पंगुम लंघयते गिरिम यत्कृपातमहं वन्दे परमानंद माधवम दिस इज सच अ लवली प्रेयर द एसेंस ऑफ दिस श्लोक इज 
divine grace. And this is one of the most beautiful shloka because it talks about the divine grace. The beauty of the divine grace is that it turns the impossibilities into realities. Let's try to understand the literal meaning of this shloka and let's try to deep dive a little bit into the depth of this shloka after that. Yat kripa tamaham vandi paramananda madhavam. I salute to that Madhava. Madhava is the name of Lord Krishna. So what is the characteristics of that Madhava I salute to? His nature is Paramananda. Paramananda means supreme joy, the supreme contentment. So I salute to that Madhava, my salutations to that Madhava, whose nature is Paramanandam, not ordinary level of happiness, extraordinary level of happiness. Salutations to Madhava, whose nature is infinite contentment. Then, what is the other nature of Madhava? The literal meaning of the word Madhava means Ma represents Mother Lakshmi, representing the entire wealth of the universe. So the Lord of the whole wealth, all resources of the universe is Madhava. And his nature is Paramananda, supreme joy. To that Madhava I salute. And when I salute this Madhava, what is the benefit of getting aligned with Madhava? Or what is the benefit of saluting to Madhava? Because his grace, Yat Kripa, whose grace can make impossibilities into realities. Two examples were cited in this shloka. Mukam Karoti Vachalam, Pankum Lankhayate Girim. His grace can transform a mute into eloquent. And a person with limp, he will be able to cross the most difficult mountain. Essentially, these two examples shows that the grace of Ishwara can turn the impossibilities into realities. So essentially, the theme of this shloka is divine grace. When I salute Madhava, when I salute Lord Krishna, or in a larger context, when I get aligned with Ishwara, the Ishwara's gaze, grace can turn impossibilities into realities. This is such a beautiful shloka. If you want to remember one shloka in the Gita Dhyanam, please remember this. Please contemplate upon the meaning of this shloka. Please use this shloka as a prayer because this is such a beautiful prayer. Now let's deep dive into some of the details of this shloka. As we discussed, this shloka talks about divine grace. Because the, as human being, our lives are not free from challenges. Every day, new new challenges emerge out in our path of life. So how do we face these challenges? Because an efficient life or a successful life is a life, not a life without challenges. The successful life is our ability to navigate through the path of life amidst all these challenges. So this shloka tells us to align with the Madhava, to align with Ishwara, so that we can confront the challenges with courage. Because it offers us protection, it offers us guidance, and this devotion, this devotion to Ishwara is going to be our greatest strength in navigating the life. If you really look at the picture in this slide, it is drawn by uh, one of the young artists we have, Shreya, Shreya Sajan. And the theme of this, this particular image shows the divine grace. On one side of the, the picture, you see a sea with rough waves and very difficult circumstances. But on the other side, when you have the grace of the Ishwara, what is going to happen? You can see that tides were calm and the climate got under control. Symbolically depict that the grace can turn the impossibilities into reality. So now the shloka talks about salutations to Madhava. Let's try to understand the meaning of the word Madhava. 
the word madhava constitute constitute of two words ma the root plus thava ma represents mother lakshmi mother lakshmi symbolically represents the entire world and prosperity and all the resources in the universe dava signifies the beloved making madhava as the custodian of all the resources he who has access to all the resources in the universe so that means madhava is somebody who has access to all the resources in the universe and what is the nature of this madhava the shloka paramananda madhavam the madhava is qualified with the word paramananda paramananda means supreme joy supreme contentment that is the essence of madhava so lord i salutations to ishwara or lord krishna whose essential nature is paramananda and who has access to all the resources of the universe another beautiful meaning of the word madhava is mauna and dhyana the one who get revealed in mauna and dhyana is madhava so a yogi or a spiritual seeker when he goes to a deep meditation as patanjali highlights in the in the yoga sutra uh, when chitta yoga ha chitta vritti nirodaha when that happens what exactly get revealed to us in the deep stages of meditation in the deep stages of silence that is madhava so that divine essence which we find within ourselves is madhava and what is the nature of that divine essence even a slight small meditation can give us that joy so that stage of samadhi where you get absorbed completely into that object of meditation when every thought is silenced your own true nature get revealed to you and the your own true nature has the nature of paramananda supreme joy so let's that is the word meaning the detailed meaning of the word madhava highlighted in this shloka and see the sweetness of the divine this madhava's charm it is always compared compared like the sweetness of honey the beautiful shloka mathurashtakam depicting um, the beauty of lord krishna highlights this aspect it says mathuradhipate akilam mathuram the lord of all sweetness is nothing but sweets everything related to ishwara is sweet his walk is sweet his talk is sweet his friendship is sweet everything related to ishwara is sweet that is the nature of the the word madhava one more point to highlight here is that when we talk about the fact that the nature of madhava is paramananda which is supreme joy from where exactly that joy comes out usually we get happy when we get an external object or when we meet a person or when we get something that is the time the happiness comes but what is the problem of that happiness it is known as vishayananda vishayananda means the, you, the joy you get when you connected with a sense object it could be another person or it could be a situation or it could be a place or it could be an object or when you get interacted with that particular sense object you get a joy out of it and that is called vishayananda but the vishayananda always has some problem what is that when that object goes away or sometimes what happens we may like that object now but tomorrow we may not like it i may like a particular food now but tomorrow i may not like it so the joy you derive out of that object is always conditional and it is always dependent upon something outside of me which is very difficult to maintain but the the paramananda we are talking here is not a vishayananda it is not derived from any object, external object it is derived from within the joy that comes out of from my own true nature that is not dependent upon any external object or a person or a situation it is completely it is not it is completely intrinsic it requires no external triggers for manifestation and that everlasting joy 
is what is called as Paramananda in this shloka. And then this shloka can be considered as a prayer to the divine because it is a potent prayer linking humanity to Madhav, the Ishwara's grace. It emphasizes that transformative power of surrender and devotion. Right? Any prayer, prayer is also an action. Just like I do a particular action, prayer is also an action. Every action in this universe has two types of results. One is tangible results and the other one is subtle results. Let's say that if I give, say, $100 as to an eligible child for its education, what is the tangible results? The child is happy. The child is able to continue his education. And I lost $100. I'm less richer by $100. That is the immediate results. But along with that tangible immediate result, there is a subtle result, Vedanta tells. And that result is known as Punya. Punya or merit, it is added to my karma. And what is going to happen? This will manifest at later point of time. Maybe tomorrow, maybe after five years, or maybe in the next life. I get that grace. This is what is called grace. Grace is the result of our punya, our karmas, or the noble actions which comes and favor us later point of time. There is something in every language of the universe called luck. Let's say that if I try to uh, invest something, I will do all my research. I will try to invest some money to a stock. Right? There are certain things I do have control. But there are so many things, there are so many hidden variables where I have zero control. If I'm going to take a flight, meaning olden times in India, let's say that I'm going to go to a trip, I stay in the bus stop, I can get the bus as planned, that is exactly as planned. Sometimes the bus can get cancelled, that is less than what I planned. Sometimes some of my uh, father's friend can come in a car and give me a gift lift, that is more than what I expected. Sometimes I can take a bus and the bus can get into an accident, worst. So, in spite of my best effort, in spite of everything, everything, every actions I am doing, there is an external factor between me and my results. And what is grace? Grace is something that comes and help me to achieve my results. So, my effort will be doubled or tripled and sometimes exponentially proportioning, blown out and I will get the results. It's just like the, the impact of grace, right? You can compare like swimming a, or crossing a river. Let's say that the current of that result, river is in the same direction of my swimming. What happens? I just, I don't need to put even any effort. Automatically, I will be crossing the river. Let's say that if the current is exactly in the opposite direction, I may not be able to cross the river. Whatever effort I put, I may not be able to cross the river. So this shloka gives a beautiful fact of the life. It says that, yes, your karma is absolutely required to live this life in this universe. But along with your karma, if you have the grace of Bhagavan, the life becomes much easier. You can navigate the life easier. And how do you earn that karma? by aligning with Ishwara, by saluting to Ishwara, by praying to Ishwara, by doing dharmic actions which are aligned with Ishwara's grace. So this shloka highlights the power of that grace. So this grace is that unseen benefit of the prayer. So seen benefit, definitely there is a psychological benefit, I feel better, etc. So this grace is the unseen benefit of the prayer. So this grace emerges from prayer and it leads to many fold blessings. It's not a random gift. God is not just waving you blessing to one person because he is just smiling at me or prostrating to me. No, it is a consequent of our karmas. When I do good karmas, I am aligning with Ishwara and as a result I will get. So essentially, 
the gris or grace is working with the law of cause and effect and it represents the karma bhala sri ramakrishna paramahamsa the great master or teacher of swami vivekananda used to give a beautiful example if you sail aligned with the direction of the wind what happens it will be a smooth sail so how do you what the grace is compared like this so if you can align your sail in line with the wind that is the best thing so aligning the sail with the direction of the wind is what is called the prayer and the good actions and the attitude of surrender so the grace the eligibility of the grace is like opening our hands to catch the rain water let's say that i'm thirsty and i want to drink some water the rain is it there is a lot of rain but for me to quench my thirst i need to open my hands get the water and drink that opening up of my hand to catch the rain water is in our hand if i keep my hand like this i may not be able to catch the rain water so this is what is grace so by aligning our karmas with dharma aligning our actions surrendering to ishwara what happens our actions becomes a vessel to receive the grace and when we have the grace possible things can happen a mute person can be elected and a limping person can cross the mountains see the very fact that ordinary people like us can do the gita class is another example uh, there are several example of this grace so the great master swami vivekananda after completing his first lecture in chicago in the world's parliament of trillion the entire chicago and entire america was completely surprised by a young indian monk 29 year old indian monk how can he conquer the whole stage uh, in a single speech when the newspaper people asked him he said mukam karoti vajalam pankum lankhayate girim etkrapata maham vande paramananda madhavam when his grace is there nothing is impossible the same thing happened to mahatma gandhi when he quoted how a half naked fakir can fight with british the entire british empire where the sun never sets in terms of resources in terms of the capacity it's impossible but how he was able to manage to gain the freedom of a great nation without shooting a single bullet mukam karoti vachalam pankum lankhayate girim et kripa tamaham mande paramananda mathama so finally this shloka echoes the divine grace it turns the divine grace turns the impossibilities into reality so the first one is this uh, shloka is a prayer invoking the grace of the ishwara and this trun- the grace has a transformative power it it helps the mute to speak and the lame to sc- scale the peaks this prayer uh, meaning it any prayer or any dharmic actions we aligned with that ishwara and the unseen power of this grace this um, karma prayer is the grace we earn and that is what uh, the essence of this shloka so let's uh, reflect on this surrender to the divine and the grace will make the unthinkable your reality this is what it is please reflect on this verse the the this this is such an important word shloka and reflecting on this can uh, help you a lot so let me re- request avanti to add her thoughts on this shloka yeah sure so first of all i think it this verse really begs a chanting together of it so i think we should just close our eyes for a minute it'll take less than a minute and just chant this together mukam karoti vachalam pangum langhayate girim yat krupa tamaham vande परमानंदमाधवम
there is not one single class of mind that i take without chanting this particular verse and although it says that the grace of god or the grace of madhavam makes the lame man scale mountains and the dumb eloquent i think the grace of madhava even enables us to speak forget eloquently even speak and enables us to do anything in our life the entire keno upanishad actually stresses on this stresses on the role of the divine within our lives and the keno upanishad has this beautiful story which i'll tell very quickly which will really make the essence of this verse stand out more for you and which will connect you to this divine grace not to do the extraordinary but to just bow down in utmost humility that we can even do the ordinary because without this nothing would be possible so to reiterate this point in the keno upanishad um there's a story there's a narrative in which the gods and the demons are fighting and the gods are actually weak and they're losing so they go to this grace they go to brahman to ask for help and brahman steps in because they invoke they pray and they eventually win the battle we've seen through all stories mortal or immortal or uh, scriptural or material that the evil tends to go on for a while much stronger and then the good has to really sum up its courage to win any war in life so it was a similar situation so with brahman's help actually uh, the gods win this battle and when they win this battle they become so excited and they just lose themselves in their win and their victory and they start celebrating with whatever they celebrated with nectar and all that and they get lost in that and as they are celebrating suddenly one apparition appears over there and that apparition was quite daunting so all of these gods get quite scared like what are they they step what is this and they step back so they approach agni god fear fire god and because obviously the most fear and say they say please go and find out what this apparition is so agni walks up to this apparition very proudly very conceitedly and stands over there and the apparition asks agni who are you very proudly agni responds me i'm agni god of fire i can burn everything on this planet so the apparition says oh really and he puts one straw of grass it puts one straw of grass in front of agni and says burn this agni must have rolled his eyes where i can burn the whole world he's asking me to burn one small grass blade of grass so he just just tries to burn it nothing he says oh that's interesting puts in some more effort puts in some more effort puts in all his effort where is huffing and puffing with all the effort that it could to burn that small blade of grass and he's not able to burn it at all he comes back very dejected he said i don't know what that is but this was my experience and everybody is quite surprised one straw of grass so they next approach uh vayu the wind god says you must go because you are also so powerful you must go and ask who this apparish So again, in the same manner, Vayu goes so proudly, so arrogantly, and he stands there in front of the apparition. Same question: Who are you? You don't know me. I'm Vayu, the wind god. Oh, what is your power? I can blow everything on this planet. Same tactic again. The apparition puts one straw of grass over there and says, "Blow this." Again, he's quite amused, and he says, "Blow this." he blows very lightly nothing happens he blows with all his might he huffs and he puffs nothing happens the blade of grass remains untouched vayu such a strong god also comes back dejected now these gods are really concerned they said if the fire god could not burn one blade of grass and the wind god couldn't blow one blade of grass this is something beyond our comprehension what is it and they all get actually fearful so then they approach indra the god of gods and fortunately indra approaches with humility he doesn't approach with arrogance and just as indra goes closer towards that apparition the apparition disappears and then the story goes on that uma parvati the daughter of the himavan she appears over there 
And in the conversation, he asked, what was that apparition that came? And then she said, that was Brahman. That was the all, the all pervading Brahman who you all took help from because of whom you won this battle and you forgot. You completely forgot. You took the glory all to yourself. And this is what we do day in and day out. In our little achievements, in our big achievements, it's all I, 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 I'm doing this. I am, you know, the doer of all of this. And actually, that is the secret. That is the secret hidden in the Bhagavad Gita. That the way to not attach karma to yourself is to not to arrogate anything to yourself. Good and bad. You do something phenomenal attributed to God, to that superpower without which Vayu and Agni are left powerless. Who are we? In the same way, when something sad or bad happens, you don't have to take it all on you. There is a reason and rhyme that comes behind that. So to take away that whole karmic consequence towards you, the secret of the Bhagavad Gita is stop being the doer. Stop saying you are the doer. Stop owning, detach from that doership. And this particular verse, Mukam Karoti Vachalam, at least to me, instills in the devotee the highest humility that you can have. Not only to progress on the spiritual path, but also to progress on the material path. Because Vidya, it is said, cannot go without Vinaya. Vidya, knowledge of anything, the ability to do anything, is helpless, it's hopeless, it's impotent without humility. You watch around. Even the greatest successes who become very arrogant fall down. They say the higher you fly, the harder you fall. Because there's no humility in the heart. So while there are a lot of other components within this verse, I think what we really, really need to focus on is that absolute acknowledgement of that divine grace which helps us to even get out of bed in the morning. And one more thing that I want to add to this is that neither Rajesh ji, neither Vikran ji and neither I would have been able to put this book together in the respect of putting this book together, we were lame and we were mute. The way each verse unfolded, the way each meaning came out of it, time and again, every day has to be sending these trembling messages to Rajeshi as we used to finish one one shloka that look, there's something else at play over here. It's not us. Yes, we are doing the work, we are putting it together, but the way as you read the book and as you understand, the way we've put it through, you will also kind of think, really? Like normal, regular grahastas, working, mothers, fathers, they can think of the Bhagavad Gita like this. It wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. And that surrender that we talk about in this particular shloka that we've laid stress on, especially even in the uh, highlighting quote at the end, that surrender, when you surrender to that divinity, Anything that you do, anything that you touch has that midas touch. It turns to gold. So from like when I said in the beginning, when we started this, I said sometimes the whole dhyana shlokas can be too much to chant before you pick up the Bhagavad Gita to study it on a daily basis. So my encouragement is whatever shloka fits with you and resonates with you, you can chant before that. But this particular shloka, if you really connect with it, if you learn it by heart and if you chant it, I've got goosebumps just now, not only before the study of the Gita, but before any endeavor that matters a lot to you, you will see miracles, I am not kidding, around that endeavor. So think about it. It's not a very difficult shloka to learn. Learn it by heart. Understand the meaning. Keep reading the meaning over and <clears> over <throat> again. Think of the Keno Upanishad story and connect with the shloka deeply. That's my humble plea. Uh, what she said is 100% true. Like this author trio, our capacity is pretty much limited. We are very ordinary people. We are not monks. We are not scholars. And our skills are very limited. And the very fact that we could produce this book is a clear illustration of the grace from that Supreme Lord. Thank you. Now let's go to the final shloka of the Gita Dhyana. Yam Brahma Varunendra Rudra Marutaha 
ಸ್ತುನ್ವಂತಿ ದಿವ್ಯೈಸ್ತವೈ ವೇದೈ ಸಾಂಗ ಪದಕ್ರಮೋಪನಿಷದೈ ಗಾಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಸಾಮಗ ಧ್ಯಾನವಸ್ಥಿತ ತದ್ಗತೇನ ಮನಸ ಪಶ್ಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಯೋಗಿನ ಯಸ್ಯಾಂತ ನವಿದುಸುರಸುರಗಣ ದೇವಾಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮಃ this is the final shloka of the gita dhyana in this final shloka salutations offered to that eternal ishwara lot of people get confused when they approach sanadana dharma the beauty and the confusing part of the sanatana dharma is the multiple options it offers to worship ishwara so we have a shiva we have a krishna we have an ayappa we have a devi and we have a subramanya like that there are multiple faces or multiple manifestations of the ishwara is provided as for us to relate often what happens is when people who are not well versed in this culture or when even the people within this culture if they don't understand properly it can be misinterpreted as polytheism and we have seen that right in lot of times if you talk to a person outside of the culture they say that the hinduism is polytheistic you worship many gods what exactly is the fact around us or what exactly is the fact about us is that true this shloka gives a beautiful answer so let's initially try to understand the literal meaning of this shloka and then we will go we, then we will deep dive into different aspect of this shloka devaya tasmai namaha i salute to that ishwara that one ishwara what exactly is the nature of this ishwara it says yam brahma varuna indra rudra maruta marutaha stunnanti divai stavai this ishwara we are offering salutation is to whom all the other manifestations of the divinity offer salutations it is called out brahma indra rudra and marut brahma ji lord shiva indra rudra meaning marut marut means uh, god in the form of wind god in the form of waters the entire un- manifestation of ishwara in different 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 form offers salutations to that one ishwara so that one ishwara which is symbolically represented by the sound syllable om it it is the all encompassing formless nameless attributes form of the ishwara but for an ordinary mind it is very difficult to visualize that ishwara without a name without a form or without attribute so for that purpose what happens every aspect every manifestation of that ishwara in this universe is given a name for us to easily relate to and it is said that in this shloka it is said that all the forms of devas devas means it is that which shines that with through which the ishwara's glory shines everybody offers salutations to that one ishwara not just all the forms of uh, the divinity offers or con- salutations to that one ishwara 
there are other people also. It says, Vedai Sangha Padakramopanishadai Gayandiyam Samaka. The very same Ishwara is celebrated by the singers of the Samaveda, who in harmony with the traditions of Pada and Krama, the Vedic chanters, chant the Veda using in two styles. One is called Krama, the other one is called Pada. Whoever sings the Vedas, Vedas means the ultimate scripture, the supreme scripture of Sanadana Dharma. And if you extend that to the modern world, any scripture, whenever somebody reads scriptures and prays the glory of the Ishwara, exactly they are praising that the glories of that one Ishwara. So the first one is that Ishwara into which the entire form of divinities are get aligned to. That Ishwara, when anybody reads and reflect on scriptures, that Ishwara is the one who is getting praised. And one more point is highlighted. The yogis in their deep meditation, deep contemplation, when their mind becomes completely quiet, what exactly they are experiencing is the presence of that divinity. So that divinity is the, the very same divinity which is which which is the manifestation of that entire universe is that same divinity get reflected in the heart of all these yogis when they do the divine meaning during the deep stages of their meditation. To that Deva, uh, to that Ishwara, I offers my salutation. <laughs> that Ishwara is equally worshipped by every forms of the universe. Devas and Asuras, even the demons and the divines, everybody worship to that one Ishura. So, in essence, this shloka reveals that the nature of that oneness, all-inclusive Ishura, to that Ishura, this shloka offers salutations. So, let's go a little bit more deep dive into this idea. As we discussed, this shloka identifies that Supreme Ishwara as nameless, formless, one Ishwara. So we are not polytheistic. We are not monotheistic. Monotheistic also has some problem. What is that? It says that there is a God and everything else is separate from that God. That is not the idea of Ishwara put forth by Sanadana Dharma or Vedanta or the Hinduism. It is totally different. It says the Ishwara's manifestation is the entire cosmos. So it is neither polytheistic, it is monotheistic. It is much beyond that. The nature of that Ishwara is existence, known as Sat, consciousness, known as Chit, and supreme contentment, known as Ananda. And it pervades everything in this universe. That is the nature of Ishwara. So please, when you hear that you guys have multiple Ishwaras, which is wrong. So please take that notion completely away from your head. And this Ishwara is the source of all understanding and all transcendence. It is, it is to this Ishwara, uh, understanding this Ishwara will transcend the worldly limitations of an individual and get connected to that one Ishwara. So, Deva, meaning in this shloka, it is said that this, this Ishwara is worshipped. Symbolically, it is said that worshipped means everything is get aligned. to. This Ishwara is aligned with all the forms of divinity that exist in the universe. Whether it is sun or the moon or the star, whether it is Brahma, Vishnu or Maheshwara, everything is aligned to this one form of Ishwara. So, essentially, it's like the government. The government is one. But when it went through for the tax functions, it is known as IRS. For the administrative functions or security functions, it is known as FBI. So the FBI, even though it has a separate form, separate means of communication, and the tax is diff meaning appears to be different, but everything is one government. Just like that, the sun appears to be different from uh, the waters, but essentially, everything is governed. Everything is the manifestation of that one Ishwara. So, the shloka says that 
Every form of divinity is connected with this one Ishwara. Every people who reads and expound the scriptures, symbolically it is said that the chanters of Sanama Veda. No, it much beyond that. Anytime when somebody reads a scripture and trying to relate themselves with Ishwara, this is what happens. That's extend extend is beyond even Sanadana Dharma. Whether it is Bible or Quran or the Dhammapada, it doesn't matter. Whenever people talk about Ishwara, they get connected to this one Ishwara. And finally, it is not just limited to the, pray, the, the Vedic scholars or the other deities. The yogis, when they experience their own true self in deep meditation, when they find experience that inner joy, that is also this Ishwara. So this is this sloka resonates with an beautiful, inspiring symphony of the praises from more every part of the universe, at meaning identifying that one Ishwara, one without second. This is the beauty of this shloka. So uh, this particular term used in this shloka is devas. Devas typically means uh, it is red, it, it sh is shining. That's the literal meaning of the deva. And the supreme deva, meaning the ultimate Ishwara, is nothing but that one Ishwara. And the Vedic chanters, uh, Vedas and Ishwara. What is Veda? Veda is the body of knowledge which talks about the nature of the Ishwara. Right? The mantras, the brahmanas, the aranyakas and the Vedanta, everything talks about Ishwara. The mantra describes various aspects of that Ishwara. The Brahmanas uh, offers rituals to worship that Ishwara. And Aranyakas offers meditative practice on the nature of that Ishwara. And Vedanta expounds the very nature of that Ishwara. And when the Vedic chanters uh, of the Samaveda, the, the popular chanters of the Veda, when they chant the Veda, essentially they are praising that one Ishwara, right? So the study, meaning it is said that these chanters of the Veda, they study the six angas of the Veda, the limbs of the Veda, known as phonetics, known as shiksha, grammar, known as vyakarana, rituals, known as kalpa, etymology is known as uh, nirukta, and the meters, known as chandas, and astronomy and astrology, known as jyotisha. All these they study and they recite the Samaveda with full knowledge of these six limbs and they use two styles. One is with Krama and the other one is Pada. It doesn't matter, right? Asan understand that uh, the scholars uh, chant the Vedas in a particular form to worship Ishwara. And all that worship goes to this one Ishwara. And uh, like the different type of chanters, when they chant Ishwara, essentially they are chanting, meaning praising this one Ishwara. So that is what is the, the chanting. And Upanishads, which is the end portion of the Veda, it gives us some knowledge. What exactly is the knowledge they give? They give us the knowledge about this one Ishwara. And finally, so we said that every forms of divinity connected to Ishwara, every forms of worship is worshipping this Ishwara or directed to this Ishwara and finally a course from the depth when a yogi contemplates his practices essentially brings his mind to a silence mode if you follow the Patanjali system of yoga the ultimate destination is called the Samadhi and Sampratnyada and Asampratnyada Samadhi at that time the mind is made completely silent and what they experience in that silent state, it is called Kaivalyam, Kevalasya Bhava, your own true nature. And that is nothing but the nature of this Ishara. And that is what is this shloka is tells. So, this shloka, finally, it is the harmony of the cosmos. Everything is related to this eternal Ishara. So, the shloka 9, it is the harmony of the universe. It is the reverence to this eternal Ishara. So, reverential spotlight on the Supreme Ishwara. Clearly showing that we don't have multiple Ishwara. There is only one Ishwara. And this is the one Ishwara which manifests in the form of different, different 
divinities or devatas. This very same Ishwara is praised by the scholars of the Vedas. And this Ishwara is the one who is experienced by the yogis in the meditative states. To that Ishwara I offer my salutations. So let's go and do a reflection. Ripping through the, the vastness of galaxies or the immaculate rhythm of a single heartbeat. There lies the anchoring knot of one supreme musician who binds the universe in perfect harmony, which is nothing but Ishwara. This is the 18th reflection of this course. Uh, please reflect on this. This is such a beautiful quote which connects the macro with the micro and the macro and micro with the true source, which is nothing but Ishwara. Let me pause here and request uh, my friend Avanti to add her comments. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll use this uh, opportunity to answer one question which was left off. We never answered it quite, uh, I think, two or three classes ago. As to uh, the question was, is it important to chant the Sanskrit prayers in the way they have been chanted by the rishis or how they've been given to us? Like the guy in three mantra, we are talking about kramas and padas over here. Or... Is it okay to just know the words and chant it in whatever tune we want? Does that make a difference? Now, this particular verse reminded me of that question. And we have to understand that when these meters were formed, whichever Rishi, whichever Muni, any of our very famous, very potent chants are attributed to, they have put these verses or these shlokas or these prayers together from a space of such deep connection to the divine that it almost has a power of its own without articulation it can cause miracles it can bring about miracles to be at that level and create these kramas and padas and create these shlokas create these uh, chants it is almost given to us on a golden platter. Here, take it and just chant it. Whether you understand the meaning to begin with or not, you will get what you want to get. So a direct answer to that question is until we are anywhere close to that stage, it is better for the more uh, potent prayers that we are prescribed within our prayer rituals or within our study rituals to stick to that original Krama, Pada, all of that. Try and stick to that so that you are gaining the power out of it. Once you understand it, once you see the benefits of it, then it is okay to, you know, chant it in whatever way you want. But in general, because it's been brought about in moments of such divine connection, it is almost, you know, stupid of us to try and chant it any other way. And over here also, if you see the glorification that has happened, it's actually said, it's mentioned over here, who is pray, pleased by the singers of the Sama Veda by singing Vedas and Upanishads in a particular kind of meter. So let's stick to that and let's try and hold those chants and those meters sacred and chant it like that. That's one thing. Another thing that is one line that stands out to me in this translation is about who is seen by the yogis who are absorbed in him. Now, that is a very, very important thing because I cannot tell you how many times Krishna has iterated and reiterated in the Bhagavad Gita that, yes, I am giving you all these beautiful paths of karma, bhakti, jnana, and you know, you all are doing charity and you're doing tapas and you're doing this, but none of it is going to give you that cosmic vision or that final understanding or that final versions with me. These are all means to an end. This is something that we have to understand at this point. Very important to understand because we are just about to step into the Bhagavad Gita. So yes, we have to give our all to it to the study of the Bhagavad Gita. But if you've understood the race of pole vaulting or the game of pole vaulting, I hope many of you all or all of you all have seen that thing. What is pole vaulting in the Olympics? There's a runner who's going to run and try and cross a very high height 
a bar that is at a very humanly unattainable height that bar is placed so what does he do he runs with a pole in his hand he goes close to that particular uh, bar he pick he picks that uh, pole into the ground heaves himself up drops the pole and jumps over correct now if he does not drop that uh, particular pole he is going to crash and if he tries to take that pole over also he is going to crash if he doesn't use the pole at all he is not going to get up to that height at all this is what all our spiritual paths are in the long run that they are means to that end we have to always bear that in mind so that we don't get caught up over oh, the bhagavad gita is saying this the upanishad is saying this that is saying this these confusions will keep arising so remember this these are all means whatever whichever part explains to you what you need to know that is what you have to hold on and even that falls away when you understand it right so we have to use it like that all of these other things when he says over here the yogis who are absorbed in him my teacher used to continuously pile drive it home that you cannot feel god with your body you cannot feel god with your mind you definitely cannot understand him by your intellect all these pointers that are given about god about brahman they are all just pointers in the bhagavad gita and the upanishads because it is impossible to articulate and explain what god is you can only become god so that is why when krishna in you know emphatically tells arjuna tasmat yogi bhav arjuna always be in that particular mode of trying to reach this state where in that final connection you are absorbed in him absorbed means what you become him. so that is something that we have to keep in mind which i thought needed an iteration here because we are just about to step into the actual study of the bhagavad gita thank you very much avanti uh, with that we concluded the study of the gita dhyanam uh, a quick recap the gita dhyanam has nine shlokas these shlokas are recited uh, conventionally traditionally before the study of the bhagavad gita especially in the advaita vedanta tradition the goal here is to connect the seeker with the teachings of the bhagavad gita so the first shloka offers salutations to mother gita the gita is visualized as a mother compassionate spiritual mother and the second shloka offers salutations to maharshi vyasa the compiler of the gita uh, the shloka praised his vast intellect and uh, it pointed out the fact that he kindled a lamp of knowledge and the third shloka offers salutations to bhagavan krishna who is the author of the gita highlighting uh, two forms of krishna one with jnana mudra symbolizing knowledge and the other one is with a whip which is driving the action and the next one is the connection between bhagavad gita and the upanishad essentially a lot of people think that they are different but bhagavad gita is nothing but uh, a summary of the upanishad and shloka 5 salutes krishna as the universal teacher jagat guru not because he is recognized by everybody but his teaching is all inclusive and applicable to the entire humanity shloka 6 presents krishna as a navigator of life and shloka 7 presents praises mahabharata and shloka 8 highlights the importance of divine grace we spent a quite of lot of time on that and finally shloka 9 offers the salutations to that one ishwara which is beyond all forms and names who is who is connected who is who is the source of all the forms of divinity who is being worshiped when any scriptures is recited in the world and the one who is discovered by the sages in their deep yogic practices to that ishwara i offer salutations so i am so glad that we were able to go through all the shlokas as detailed as possible uh, please read the book the first step into bhagavad gita for more information if you have any questions please let us know you can always listen to these talks in youtube as well as uh, the spotify so please uh, listen to these talks please share these messages please subscribe and share these messages and please put comments and please the subscribe the youtube channel as well as the spotify 
and next week we will get into the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you.